Hi everybody, I'm Al Rochelle. As we continue our discussions about dysautonomia, we're going to be talking about exercise and the importance of that with Dr. Craig Colby, who joins us right now. Doctor, thank you so much for coming by. Well, thank you for inviting me. Give me a little bit about your background and how you were involved with dysautonomias. Okay. Um, I trained at Texas Children's Hospital um, as a pediatrician, as well as Baylor College Medicine as an internist. So. Mm -hmm. I have a background that's quite diverse, and then spent um, an additional time in fellowship training in pediatric sports medicine specifically. Oh gosh. And then most recently, last year, um, I uh, passed the board certification for autonomic disorders. Okay, so when, we, the, the, when we've been talking about this is that exercise can actually help people who have autonomic disorders. How is that possible and why? Uh, exercise is the cornerstone for recovery for uh, patients with uh, autonomic disorders, specifically POTS, uh, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. Um, any of these disorders that result in inability to tolerate standing up, um, it's important that they um, in incorporate exercise. Without the exercise, it's, uh, it's really hard to find a cure. Now, it seems a little bit cross-intuitive is the word yeah. I use, because yeah. you go, wait a minute, I can hardly walk or I can't even get up, and now you're telling me that I've got to exercise? Yeah, so it, it really comes down to the pathophysiology of what we're discussing. Um, the, the the dysautonomic patients have a commonality in their disorders mm -hmm. um, that we can see in the POTS patients to the chronic fatigue patients and even sometimes the, the patients with Ellis, Danlos, and fibromyalgia. Uh -huh. um, that commonality is a failure of circulation, making it to the heart when they're standing upright. They can result as much as a 40% drop in cardiac output. Um, that gives them the, the syndrome of um, fatigue. Mm -hmm. you know, that cardiac output of that flow out of the heart and fails to meet the metabolic needs of the body. And from there comes much of the symptoms that the patients talk about, including this, uh, the fight or flight overactivation, yeah. um, which produces uh, norepinephrine and, uh, and adrenaline that produces um, the, the tachycardia. So there are um, several interventions that are recommended by um, international consensus statement published in 2015 mm -hmm. um, by the Heart Rhythm Society. And in this statement, they rated all the interventions for patients who are dealing with um, specifically POTS, but other um, disorders of dysautonomias, and rated their scientific um, rel relativity. Um, a, a level 1A evidence is would be the highest possible. Okay. Um, exercise, they, there is no level 1A evidence yet but, um, for anything we do, but exercise is the closest we come to as a level 2A recommendation. Okay. Because that's what people want. They want science behind this rather than just saying, well, let's do exercise because we think it makes you feel good. Yeah. The, the biggest difference uh, and problem with saying just go exercise is um, patients often get bad advice on how to do it. Um, I, I once had a patient who um, had been going for 10, 15 years without a diagnosis, finally went to Mayo Clinic, was diagnosed with POTS and EDS, mm -hmm. but, and was told she needed to exercise and needed to do the fluids and the salt. And, but she found she physically could not do it. And by the time she got to me, she'd seen 70 physicians, tried 40 medications, oh. and she was bed bound with no ability really to raise her head out of the bed. And I met her in a recumbent wheelchair um, well, with no ability to stand up. Yeah, so the how-to, that how, then how is it that you teach the how-to? So what worked for her was uh, proper education on how to do um, these, what we called non-pharmacological um, lifestyle changes, and key to it was exercise. Uh, so when these patients, and this, and this particular patient it was severe, when they stand up, there is that drug blood pooling that drops down into their lower pelvis mm -hmm. um, and legs, and in a normal person, uh, you know, there's about 700 milliliters of blood that drops, and within milliseconds, it's pushed back up to the heart, and we feel nothing. And these patients, when the blood drops, and the body senses that and sends out a signal to increase the squeeze and to make things three to four times uh, tighter than normal, but get back to the heart. Sometimes that just does not occur in these patients. Yeah. So they experience um, a, a dramatic loss in energy and ability to function. So if patients told to go exercise, and they exercise in the upright position, it'll actually make their condition worse, um, mm. and will result in sometimes a crash for days on end. Oh, days on end. So let's talk about uh, uh, some of these underlying conditions. For example, what about patients that have chronic fatigue syndrome? Exercise, good, bad, what? Uh, so the, the, I think the current research is supporting the use of chronic, uh, for chronic fatigue exercise as well. The, that's not the general opinion. There's, there's some beliefs that they have an energy bank yeah. and that you can't use so much energy per day. Um, and uh, there's uh, many specialists who believe that they should not exercise. Um, but the, the, the most recent data that I'm aware of demonstrates that if you, if you take a chronic fatigue patient 
who has no change in heart rate and blood pressure upon standing up mm -hmm. versus a POTS patient who has no change in blood pressure but the heart rates get very high upon standing up. And then you take a, another chronic fatigue patient whose um, heart rate doesn't raise but the blood pressure drops um, on, um, on orthostatic testing. Mm -hmm. What you'll find is the same, uh, almost the identical cerebral um, hypoperfusion that occurs in all three groups, about 40%. Oh, gosh, yeah. Um, so sometimes I think we give everyone these categories, but we might be talking about um, similar um, pathophysiologies. Yeah, a little bit challenging. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> so um, my, my approach has been, all these years, is to treat my chronic fatigue patients no different than any of my other dysautonomic patients. Um, but the, the key is to give them proper uh, instructions. So for my patient who, 70 physicians, 10 years, bed bound, 40 medications, nothing worked. Um, what worked for her was just really good education and we kind of met her where she was at. We figured out that because she had such massive blood pooling that we laid her on her back and then turned a red come bike machine around and put the legs up. And that changed the physiology of what she was going through. So now sure. the blood was flowing back to the heart um, with no, no need for input by the sympathetic nervous system. Wow. And as she did that, then her body um, re started reconditioned. Yeah. The, the reality of this disorder is they feel terrible all the time and upright, so they want to lay down. Um, and, they, and as you lay down and not exercise, the patient's deconditioned. Yeah. You can lose up to 30% of your body mass with bed rest, or your, your muscle mass with bed rest um, within two weeks. And to recover that, it takes maybe up to six weeks to recover that. Man, I didn't know that was so fast, two weeks. Very fast. Now let's talk about uh, uh, the, the same patients that have EDS, which is that joint condition. Mm -hmm. you, you would think that maybe they could overexert themselves because they're able to have almost that double jointedness feature. Can they, can they exercise safely? Yeah, it, it's very interesting. If you look at all these disorders, chronic fatigue, um, uh, fibromyalgia, POTS, what you find is a very high rate of um, patients who meet the 2017 diagnostic criteria, criteria for hypermobility Ellis Downs syndrome, um, you know, about 30, 31 percent. And then uh, if you expand it beyond the, the, that definition, you, know, you see even higher population that meets the um, hyper, uh, hyper, um, hyper mobility spectrum disorder. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there seems to be, in, with his patients, a higher rate of pain due to joint instability. Um, yeah. We know that from research it's not due to arthritis. Um, what it is is just the excessive movement in the joint resulting in pain and stretch from the, um, the, those connective tissues. Mm -hmm. um, the only way to overcome pain with Ellis Danlos um, and uh, those who've been diagnosed with fibromyalgia is to strengthen those joints. Because the ligaments ha are so loose, um, we have to do something it, to replace that, and that's uh, muscle strengthening. So a yeah. uh, key for many of these patients is in, a two, in addition to recumbent exercise, um, is to do um, lightweight reconditioning, muscle strengthening, and usually it's preferred with a physical therapist who's trained because they can overdo it with the weights and repetitions. Um, the key with all these patients is you start slow and go slow in the, the, in the creasing. So for exercise, uh, uh, what we recommend is that they start recumbent. Um, swimming is excellent, because while you're in the water, the hydrostatic pressure of the water almost what takes away the pathophysiology of POTS, um, and, they, uh, and is, it's one of the most cardiovascular things that we do. Um, you can also do rowing machines. We prefer one with a flywheel, so there's um, um, a natural motion there, and, um, and then recumbent bike. But basically the rule is, any exercise where your legs are below you is a no-go. Um, oh. Any exercise where your legs are in front of you or above you is, is where you want to be. Yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll just say this as a person who likes to exercise yeah. <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> yeah. is that to make sure that it's a doctor guided because it, the thing with exercise is that when you start doing the exercise, it may not feel good. Now, these, these patients feel terrible when they first start. Yeah. Um, actually, if I'm deconditioned and I exercise, I don't feel that great either. Right. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'll, I'll feel sore. I'm like, why am I doing this? Um, but they feel it at, um, at, at, at 10 times worse than the rest of us. Yeah. Um, but it's really important that we accommodate their, their physiology while they exercise so they don't have their crash. So in addition to a recumbent exercise program, um, Levine um, has published out of, um, out of Dallas uh, their Levine protocol. It's based on some of the... Um, uh, the NASA data of how to recover someone who's lost um, autonomic function while they're in microgravity in space. Yeah. And it's very effective for the POTS patients, a program over three months. And um, our clinic with our physical therapists, we've taken that, expanded. It's a nine-month program, so it's very slow. Yeah. But we start them off in recumbent, and as they get stronger and better over time, we then start moving them upright, 
and back down to eventually they're upright. Right. Um, but to help them in their physiology, is it's very important that while they're doing exercise, sometimes they're wearing compression pants or tights. Mm -hmm. Specifically, you want to cover from the knee up to the above the, the chest. Um, that helps push the blood up. And then it's very important that they always volume expand with salt and water before. Um, we recommend um, uh, products that are like the oral rehydration salt um, recommended by the World Health Organization, but something that um, uh, something with salt and glucose together um, and rehydrate before and then afterwards. Um, and then the second uh, point that's really uh, that we want to make it is that these patients should never when they're exercising, just immediately stop exercising. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an immediate drop in pressures and they will feel horrible. So it's really important there's always a, a slow yeah. ramp down um, yeah. as they adjust. And they should always, um, if they've been doing upright exercise, return back to a recumbent exercise in that ramp down um, so there isn't a sudden loss of blood flow to the brain. Um, yeah, and for exercising, you're really supposed to do that normal people are too. I mean, yeah. people that don't have any other conditions, yeah. it's supposed to be a slow ramp down. That's great. So you brought this uh, chart for us to take a look at and explain it for me if you would, please. Yeah. So this is a, a, um, a slide from one of my lectures mm -hmm. um, that, rep that summarizes the, the key um, scientific statements that are recommended for treatment in patients with dysautonomia, um, their non-drug treatments. There's three primary goals. Um, at the, the top you see is that half these patients have a loss of volume that is, is, is there and we want to volume expand that um, to help um, get that blood and fluid to the heart. Um, and the main uh, treatments for that is you can see number one, step one or number one, three liters of water per day. And then number two, salt supplementation. And this salt supplementation should be both in diet as well as by um, pills or um, uh, high um, dose sodium uh, electrolyte drinks. Okay. Um, if you don't have the volume expansion to begin with prior to exercise, it does not go as well. Right, now tell me the rest of the chart here. And then the, the next goal is um, to promote vasoconstriction. Part of the pathophysiology is their vasodilated and their blood pooling in the legs. That's why we see a lot of patients with purple legs, but um, much more pale on top. Mm -hmm. And so external compression is key, and that's where you wear the compression pants and tights. Um, that very much helps um, tolerance with exercise as well. Sure. So we recommend that they wear them during exercise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even if you are exercising in a pool, a lot of our patients feel great in a pool, and then when they are, um, as soon as they get out of the pool, they have an event because there's a, that loss of hydrostatic pressure. Putting on compression pants, uh, beforehand and having them on on the way out usually uh, decreases those um, side effects quite a bit. And then the last circle there? And then the last circle is, um, a, you know, they, they're dealing with rapid heart rate is, um, uh, and so we, all the strategies used to lower the heart rate naturally what we're looking for. Um, and so a proper sleep hygiene seems to play a key role. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we recommend behavioral therapy uh, is to learn how to um, uh, develop coping mechanisms to calm down their own worries so they can lower the heart rate. Um, and, but the, the key one you're going to see at the bottom there is recumbent cardio exercise. Yes. It's the foundation of everything we do. That's why I place at the bottom. It achieves all three of those, volume expansion, vasoconstriction, and low heart rate. And the way that does that is when you exercise, it creates a stress in the body with the kidney, and it's actually going to pull in salt and water on a more consistent basis and change that. Vasoconstriction, as you're exercising, you can increase the, the, uh, the mass of your, mm -hmm. your muscles in your heart, sometimes up to 10%. And, and, um, and so over time, that becomes a, a, a play, you know, there's less blood to pull if right. there's more yeah. um, muscles present. And the low heart rate, how does that play with cardiovascular exercise? Well, after proper exercise recumbently um, with a sympathetic activation that occurs, there's always a counter parasympathetic, which we call uh, rest and digest. And you will see for the rest of the day after cardiovascular exercise that the heart rates are lower the whole rest of the day. Oh, that's great. And they have yeah. those benefits for up to about um, 24 hours. Oh, that's tremendous. So, um, and then over time, as you condition your heart conditions, your heart rate will naturally lower. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, cardiovascular exercise achieves is all three of our goals. Without drugs. Um, without drugs. But in our patients, they do need to support this process with proper fluids, proper salt, proper yeah. compression, and then um, controlled resistance training according to their needs and their condition. So two quick things, your message to physicians out there that are watching this video right now, what would you say to them? 
Um, I would say is that these patients uh, can be helped greatly, and we consider exercise the cornerstone and key to recovery. Um, and I think the research is going to uh, support and does support the use of recumbent exercise, both for POTS as well as chronic fatigue, as well as Alice Danlos and fibromyalgia. Um, these, the, these patients share a commonality of a problem with tolerating gravity. So when you do the exercise, you need to mitigate that as much as possible. And your job as a physician is to teach them how to do this. Right, right. Um, had my patient received proper advice years before, um, she would have done better. Um, after years of wheelchair, um, after two months we had her out of a wheelchair, and after oh, three months great. we had her pain free, and now she has a job. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And, and what would you say to patients too, because they're gonna be watching this too. Um, a lot of the patients are going to the doctors looking for that miracle cure pill. Right. Um, and there is really no health in a pill. We use the pills and the medicines to accommodate physiology that may be difficult to enable exercise, but when it comes down to getting better, the only thing that I've ever seen that makes a dramatic uh, difference to my patients is consistent exercise. In the very beginning, you start out maybe every other day, but it's the consistency of doing it right. um, over time, um, and I, I treat medicine um, like it's a I like the drug. You know, exercise is medicine. Oh yeah, yeah, it is. That's a lot cheaper it. too. It, a lot cheaper, um, but it has the ability to change the physiology of the body and actually change what's happening mm -hmm. um, in a meaningful way. As soon as you quit exercising, though, you'll decondition and go back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my pa many of my patients have found that they have to do it seven days a week once they've built up. They do it seven days a week, and they dose it like a drug. Yeah. And um, by doing so, they maintain their, they are functional. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's also a healthy lifestyle if you get yeah. that up. Doctor, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it, and continued good work with what you're doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.